أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الحمد لله الذي هدانا لهذا وما كنا لنهتدي لولا أن هدانا الله الحمد لله الذي أنزل الفرقان على عبده ليكون للعالمين نذيرا والصلاة والسلام على خير خلق ونور عرش أفضل الأنبياء والمرسلين حبيبنا وسيدنا وسندنا وشفيعنا ومولانا أبي القاسم محمد وعلى آله الطيبين الطاهرين المأسومين المظلومين أما بعد فقد قال الله سبحانه وتعالى في كتاب المجيد وقوله الحق وهو أستق الصادقين بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم حاميم والكتاب المبين إن أنزلناه في ليلة مباركة إن كنا منذرين فيها يفرق كل أمر حكيم أمرا من عندنا إن كنا مرسلين رحمة من ربه إنه هو السميع العليم صدق الله العلي العظيم صلوات على محمد وآل محمد I begin in Allah's name the beneficent the merciful we're grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for nothing is more precious to Allah when his created created beings creation like you and I indulge in gratitude when you are grateful, God will give you more. And the antithesis to that is, And if you are a rejecter, you're ungrateful, you do not appreciate what Allah has given you, then you will be punished with a severe punishment. So I begin in this name with much gratitude. And I know that you and I, as much as we may ponder and reflect on all that which Allah has given us and be grateful about it, we will never be grateful enough. For Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us that He has given us zahiratan wa batina, that which you are able to see, ni'amahu zahiratan wa batina, that, that which you can see and that which you cannot see. And there is so much that we don't even recognize that are mercies of Allah. And if we will not recognize it, until we die and go into our graves. And tonight I'd like to start this conversation, as you know, the whole theme of this 15 nights is self-purification, tazkiyatun nafs. Allah says, قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّاهَا وَقَدْ خَابَ مَنْ دَسَّاهَا Successful is the one who purifies, and of course failure is the one who impurifies. And the impurity, Allah says, كَذَّبَتْ ثَمُودُ بِتَغْوَاهَا so Allah SWT in Surah Al-Shams is giving us an example how he perfected this self, taught it wrong and right. And Allah says successful is the one who purifies it. Failure is the one who impurifies it. And then Allah gives us an example of the impurification that led to failure. Allah says, كَذَّبَتْ ثَمُودُ كَذَّبَتْ They belied. The tribe of Thamud belied. That means lying is one of the core principles of impurity. When you and I indulge in lies, and we all know lying is something that just does not sit well with anybody. Even those who lie, don't like to be lied to, as I mentioned. Proof positive that it's not a good thing. Arrogance. People who are arrogant don't like arrogant people. You notice that. People who hurt don't like to be hurt. People who are rude don't like people to be rude to them. People who are harsh don't like people to be harsh to them. These are intrinsic natures that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has put into our souls and into our fitrah that tells us without any training whatsoever that at the get-go upon birth we're aware of these faculties and Allah says maintain it and how do you maintain it? Don't go towards the negative, make sure you keep it towards the positive. قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ زَكَّى Right? قَدْ أَفْلَحَ مَنْ تَزَكَّى وَذَكَرَ اسْمَ رَبِّهِ فَصَلَّى Who's successful? The one who remembers Allah and maintains prayer. Right? Meaning purify yourself. How? By remembering Allah 
and keeping prayers, speaking the truth, not being rude, not being harsh, not bullying others. And these are qualities that are very prevalent in society where people bully, they speak harsh. Online, people are wicked. There is so much trolling online where people just have nothing better to do and they're destroying people's lives electronically by sending nasty words, nasty images, making fun of others. These are the people whose hearts are impure. And the purification of the heart doesn't require much work. It just requires introspection, awareness. Thank God we have the month of Ramadan that increases our awareness. It makes us more aware of the fact that right and wrong are distinctly different. And while I'm in a state of fasting, there are things that Allah has forbidden me which are normally allowed. But why has he forbidden me? To make me acutely aware so that I don't become a person of ghafil, ghafla. Just like when you do your ihram, when you go to hajj and the minute you've done the ihram, ihram makes certain things haram. And you're going to masjid al-haram, meaning that which certain things are forbidden. Look at how beautiful it is. Haram has such positive connotation here. Where halal means you're not going to indulge in mundane foolishness. You're not even going to kill a mosquito that's biting you in the state of ihram. You're not allowed to do that. You must push the mosquito off. You cannot kill it. If you killed it, there is a kafara. There is a penalty for it. Think about it. Just in the state of ihram, there is a penalty in killing an insect that's biting me. Allah says that's correct. I want you to be aware because when you are aware, then shaitan cannot fool you easily. But when you're in a state of ghafla, when you're in the state of, in other words, your, your mind is no longer focused, then shaitan fools us. Look at shaitan. I mentioned yesterday the instrument of darkness, the instrument of music. These are very powerful instruments that take us away from awareness to some degree. It puts us in a state of fantasy. Nightclubs typically are dark. Bars typically are dark. They don't want you to see the clarity of the person. They want to obfuscate your vision. Iblis is a master of obfuscation. In English, obfuscation is when you cover something. You don't want somebody to see it. Elucidation is the opposite. When you put light on it. When you put light on it and you see clearly. You see the edges very clearly. You see the devil clearly then you'll avoid him. But if he's hidden in a guard, right, in the darkness, or in semi-darkness, he will fool you. Allah, in the state of fasting, wants me to put light into it, wants me to see, wants me to see through darkness, wants me to cut through curtains behind walls where opaque objects become transparent to me. That's purification of the soul. When the self is purified, it doesn't get beguiled. It doesn't get fooled. It's hard. You know, a person comes to Imam Jafar Sadiq alayhi salatu wa salam. Salawat ala Muhammad wa al Muhammad. And said, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, why don't you lie? Now we ask the question, and this is a philosophical question. We say our prophets and imams were infallible, meaning they could make mistakes, but they never did. We say, oh, it's impossible. To err is human. Humans have to make mistakes. Our prophets and imams were humans, therefore they must have made mistakes. No. No. They don't have to make mistakes. There are people on earth who make less mistakes than others. But they're still human. If to, be, if to be human is to make a mistake, then we should all make the same mistakes. Why is it that some make less mistakes than others? That's proof positive in itself that there's a gradation of the ability and the inability to commit sins within the human race. Therefore, it's logical that there has to be a group of human beings who don't commit any sin. You might say, but how is that possible? And by the way, the illogicity of some people because of their myopic thinking, maybe they don't understand Allah and how he functions, that they think infallibility is only for Allah. Meaning when you're perfect and don't make mistakes, that's a divine principle that only God has and all his creations are impervious to this infallibility, meaning Every created being has to make a mistake. Not true at all. Absolutely not. In fact, Allah is beyond perfection. When you and I say Allah is perfect, 
Perfection is a, is a terminology of comparatives. Whereas Allah says, Alladhi laysa kamithlihi shay. There is no comparison to Allah. So you cannot compare perfection with Allah. Allah is beyond perfection. We cannot say Allah does things perfectly. What Allah does is perfect to us. But it's beyond perfection. For perfection is a comparative of existent beings. What do you say about a being coming into existence when it didn't exist? What do you call that then? It's beyond perfection. For there's one thing to compare. There's another to bring something into existence when it did not exist. هَلْ أَتَى عَلَى الْإِنسَانِ حِينُ مِنَ الدَّهْرِ لَمْ يَكُنْ شَيْئًا مَذْكُورًا Has mankind not considered that they were not worthy of being mentioned? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, you don't compare me with you. But when I send my agents, and when I send my prophets and imams, I train them, I guide them. How? When a person comes and says, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, why don't you lie? Lying. Allah says, خَلَقَ السَّمَاوَاتِ وَالْأَرْضَ بِالْحَقِّ I created the universe in truth. And the principle of Islam is entirely to be truthful. Imam Jafar Sadiq says, and at that time we didn't have these vitreous toilets today where you flush and there's amount of water to prevent the smell from coming through. It was a genius idea to create that little, you know, uh, yes, exactly. Salawat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. Plumbing 101. <laughs> but subhanAllah, today, by, mashallah, you go to a bathroom, it's like a living room, right? It's got perfume, carpet. You don't even know this is a bathroom, mashallah. We've become very sophisticated, which is good. Which is good. We should maintain purity physically. In Allah, you have mutatahirin. God loves who purify themselves, people who smell good, who look good, have clean teeth, clean breath, you know, clean body, clean hair. This is the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The Holy Prophet was very meticulous. He was very natty looking. He was dressed very clean. He wasn't ostentatious. He wasn't opulent. He didn't wear fancy dresses. But he was simple but beautiful and clean. He looked at himself. He combed his hair. Made sure he smelled good. They say when he would sweat, his, his sweat would sparkle like pearls. That's how handsome and beautiful he was. He was very attractive. People love to look at him because he's rahmatul alameen. He's a mercy from Allah. He had to look good. Our imams looked good. The women of the Ahlul Bayt were good looking. Regardless of how they looked. That purity. So Imam says, have you been to the toilet and put your hand inside that hole? Now at that time, we did, they didn't have these toilets. So things were visible. And you know, when, you, when people went there, they would hold their breath just to go in there. The Imam says, have you put your hand in there? And the man made a face. He said, that's how we see lies. So to us, when, we, if you, when you lie, we see you putting your hand in the toilet. It's very ugly. It's disgusting. Like Allah says, no, do not backbite each other. Are you hibbu ahadukum an ya'kula? لَحْمَ أَخِيهِ مَيْتًا فَكَرِهْتُمُ Look what Allah describes. When you backbite your brother, when you backbite anybody, it's like you've eaten the flesh of your dead brother. Just imagine you have a brother and you just took a knife and took a piece of their meat and you stuck it in your mouth and you're chewing it. Allah says, فَكَرِهْتُمُ It's disgusting. Well, that's backbiting. When people backbite, in front of the Prophet or Imam, Imam say, we see flesh stuck between your teeth. They say, Yadna Rasulullah, what do you mean? We know you were backbiting. And we see it in physical state. We don't see it because our hearts are not pure. When our hearts become pure, we see it. You actually physically see the ugliness. You start to become infallible when your heart is pure. The more pure you become, the more infallible you become. Did you know that? So people think that infallibility is with Allah. It's not. It's with His creation. How? By Allah showing them with awareness and clarity, with vision, 
with no ambiguity, the clarity of what is bad and ugly. Whereas you and I, what is shaitan a master of? He's the master of beguiling. He camouflages ugliness with beauty. He puts glitter and color and attraction with good smell and he invites you to that which is haram by hiding it. That's why he said, I will beguile them all. But look, even Iblis says, Except by those, except to those whom you have purified. Mukhlas is different from Mukhlis. Just a quick notation, I know you've heard this before, but Mukhlas is intrinsically pure from birth. 24 by 7, never moving away from purity. Mukhlas is different from Mukhlis. In the Quran, for example, in Surah Luqman, Allah says, وَإِذَا غَشْيَهُمْ مَوْجُونَ كَذْدُلَ لِي دَعْوُ اللَّهَ مُخْلِسِينَ لَهُ الدِّينَ فَلَمَّا نَجَّاهُمْ إِلَى الْبَرِّ فَمِنْهُمْ مُخْتَصِرٍ وَمَا يَجْحَدُ بِآيَاتِنَا إِلَّا كُلُّ خَتَّارٍ كَفُورٍ I mentioned this verse numerous times. Allah says, when the waves cover them, they are disbelievers, they don't believe in me, their hearts are not pure. They don't obey me, they don't listen to me, they're arrogant, they're recalcitrant. Some people say, Haji, you're using too many tough words here. Sometimes people use AP English. Yeah, well then, go to dictionary.com and figure it out, because I think our community and our society needs to raise its standards in its English. My English is not that good, with all due respect, please. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. May Allah bless you for being so kind, but really, let's raise the standards. Because it's very, very important for us to know some basic English words. If we speak English, you speak Arabic, use the best Arabic words. You speak Farsi, use the best Farsi words. Be fussy with it, you know? Be smart with it, because people judge you based on how you speak. So these people are in the ocean, the waves are covering them. Allah says, Rasham Mawjun Kadulali Da'ullah, they turn to Allah, Mukhlisina, sincerely. That's temporal sincerity. Mukhlisin is different from Mukhlasin. They are temporarily, they realize, oops, I'm going to die. And by the way, it's very interesting when people say, you know, is Allah with us all the time? You know, where is God? And I mentioned this, by the way, very interesting. And I mentioned this in my lectures previously. You know, you turn the lights off, even non-believers, and you tell them the devil is in this room, they'll all run out, even atheists. But you tell them the light turned on and God is it as aware. But you didn't see the devil either. So why'd you run out? Why did you have blind faith in the devil? People have no problem with the devil. Do you ever notice? When you say to people, you know, the devil, oh yeah, no problem. You're not an atheist. But the devil hasn't been seen. Subhanallah. But look at the faith. But you realize that when Allah says, Nahnu aqrab min wareed, Allah is closer to us than our jugular veins. How do we know this? Simple footnote. When we are about to die, the most important things matter. The less important things don't matter. When the house is burning, when you're in the hospital and you're about to die, you're going to breathe your last. What are you going to think about? Your toys? Your car? Your silly things? Or the little arguments you had with people? No. You're going to think about your life. You're going to think about your family. You're going to think about the most precious things you have. The, the more precious they are, the more they'll come to you. Subhanallah, the entire human race when death is about to overtake them, they all turn to God. The whole human race. Oh my God. Where was God before? People say, well, there's no God. But why is it that the minute you start to drown, or the minute there's an earthquake, or the minute you're going to die, we all turn to Allah. And it's classic. I'm not saying this, you know, unfairly. I ask you, challenge it. Have you ever heard and seen, by any standards, even those who are ardently against God, not turn to God when they're in danger. They hold on to something. Oh my God. Even atheists have told me this. He says, you know, one atheist told me, my wife is a theist. I'm not, I'm an atheist. We were once on a little canoe and the weather changed and we were about to drown. My wife was cool as a cucumber because she believed in God. I was terrified. So I said, then what were you thinking about? She says, I was very inclined to think like my wife. I said, but you're an atheist. He said, well, what am I going to hold on to? You know? You're about to die, you're nowhere to go. SubhanAllah, Allah is with us. He said, look at them, look at the way. But that truth that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala infuses in us, 
is given to us in the state of purity through understanding. So the more pure we become, the more pliant we become, the more submissive we become, the more truthful we become, and the more vision we have, and the more we will avoid the haram. So when we talk about the purity of prophets, notice, mukhlas, intrinsically pure. Mukhlisin, temporary purity. What does Allah say? When we bring them back, when we bring them back, to shore, they were very sincere on that ship. They turned to me, But when we brought them back to shore, they took the middle ground. We don't know. Is there really a God? That must have been just a lucky wave that pushed us back. See? So Allah SWT says, that had a temporal purity. Had a temporal submission to Allah. But I love these temporal states. Because it's an indicator of what is true in myself. What lies in me that when I am in danger and I turn to Allah, then Allah says, now you, do you believe me or don't you? When Allah says, Once again Allah is talking to me in the Quran. He says, don't you see the universe was one? We opened it up for you. And we made all living things out of water. He has another comparison, Allah. He's giving me a physical example, scientific, empirical observation of modern day science. 100% proof that life requires water. Water is the cause of life. The main component of life. In fact, water is the sustainer of life. The metabolic processes of all living beings requires water. Allah said, Allah has struck it clearly, clarity. Just like Imam Jafar Salih, seeing somebody putting their hands in the toilet. Allah is making it very clear for me that here it is. You saw the universe open up. You see this. Do you still not believe? Subhanallah. What I love about Allah's conversation with me is that He is mighty. When Allah says, Tabarak al biyadihi al-mulk, wa huwa ala kulli shay'in qadir. Blessed is He. Tabarak al Biyadihi al-mulk. The entire universe is in his hand. Biyadihi al-mulk. Wa huwa ala kulli shay'in qadir. He has authority over everything. Ida qada amran fa inna ma yaqulu lahu kun fa yakun. When God decrees a matter, he says be and it is. He's that powerful. More powerful than all kings put together. And he's talking to me, a little creation of his. Tiny little speck among specks. Me absolutely insignificant in relations to all his creations. Yet he talks to me like I'm incredibly significant. And he talks to me with such candor and love that he cajoles me. He tries to make my heart soft to bring me back to him. And he's given me that power to choose my destiny. And he's the king of kings. He can make me disappear. Allah can take me to nothingness. Yet he's talking to me. Brothers and sisters, please, I want you to understand this. Allah is conversing with us in the Quran. He's rationalizing with us in the Quran. He's reasoning with us in the Quran. If that is not honor, I don't know what is. I dare to ask any king out there that's trying to tell its subordinates, this is what I want, come and sit with me and let me reason with you. Does a king ever do that or does a king command? And you are not allowed to question. And you will obey. And if you don't obey, they will decapitate you. They will crucify you. Allah is conversing with me. And then I told him, no, I don't agree with you. And then I tell him, I don't want to follow you. And then I tell him, I don't believe in you. And he doesn't throw a lightning bolt on my head. Nor does a meteor drop on my head. Nor does he stop my heart from pumping. Allah says, look how much mercy I have on you. How much I believe in you. How much I trust you. If that is not the Rahmah of Allah, with all due respect, and I'm not standing on this pulpit to impress anybody about this matter, for this is intrinsic within all of us, that our power of purification lies within us. That the minute we introspect and look at the Quran, and look at the way Allah made a system, that when an atheist comes and says, I don't believe in God, I says, what a merciful God that he has allowed this creature, this creation to even say that, and to get away with it, while they're alive. And that they're able to eat and 
go to the hospital and take medication when they're sick and get cured, yet they maintain that reason that reason, illogical reason against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If that is not the rahmah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, I don't know what is. So infallibility of prophets is not something magical out there. It's not something robotic out there. And anybody says, oh, the prophets and imams cannot be infallible because only God is infallible. I said, we need to sit down over a little coffee and tea and we need to talk about it. Because you seem to be a little bit off the mark when it comes to definitions. Now, I ask all of us, you know, if you score a perfect score, if, if you don't make a mistake, that makes you godly. Almost every one of us in this room probably got 100 in an exam. Sometimes we get 105. Extra credit. So you're better than good. Ooh, you got 105 out of 100. Ooh, that's extra credit. Wow, subhanAllah. Now, did that make you a god? <laughs> Just because you got 100? Well, I got a perfect score. I'm godly, I'm divine. No. It's human nature, Allah says, that all human beings have capacities. In fact, there are things that you and I have done in life until this age, until death, where we never slip. For example, we can kill. It's easy to kill. In this world today, especially with the machines we have today, so easy to kill. But most of us, alhamdulillah, don't kill. So subhanAllah, we're infallible in killing. Does that make us God? No. What it does is Allah says, those are some of the core components that you can practice infallibility in. But inshallah, those which you're not infallible in, those where you keep slipping and making mistakes, such as lying, cheating, backbiting, inshallah, you will become more infallible there by stopping it, by purifying, by moving away from it. That is the entire trajectory of the purification of the self. Salawat ala Muhammad wa Muhammad. Simple example, and of course, when I mention about prophets not making mistakes, mashallah, a lot of you came and asked me about Adam, you know, about Yunus, and um, of course, Prophet Musa alayhi salam. These are all very, very simple answers, but a simple, quick one, because my focus today I want to speak on the Quran, how the Quran was revealed, its beauty. But a simple example, same thing, it's the same conversation. But you will find that people say, Adam, did he not make a mistake? Well, let's look at the logic of the Quran. The Quran sometimes appears to be mutashabihat. And I'll, I'll recite this verse, by the way, in Surah Ali Imran, verse number seven. Allah says, we've given you two kinds of verses. I'll describe this tomorrow about the two kinds of verses, muhkamat, Okay, which is Ummul Kitab wa Ukharu Mutashabihat. And those which are allegorical, which now have to turn back, you know, they have to go back to the mother of the Quran, which is the Muhkamat. So Quran says we're giving you two kinds of verses. Interesting, you will notice that actually the more pure our heart, the less Mutashabihat in the Quran. You know, Mutashabihat varies, it increases and decreases. Mutashabiyah means allegorical, meaning there's more than one meaning. Mahkam means it, it's, it's clear. I understand this meaning. I'm not confused. But there are verses we say, what is Allah implying by this verse? You see? Like Abasa wa Tawalla, he frowned and turned away. Who is this person? What does Allah mean by this? It's Mutashabiyah. I don't understand. Was this the Prophet? Unfortunately, there are those, some of them who translate and put in parentheses the Prophet. With all due respect, it's a lie. It's not true. The Prophet did not frown, nor did he turn away from the poor man, the old man who was blind. He did not. But these are, unfortunately, the myopic, the myopic vision of people, even though they may translate the Quran, their understanding is limited. In fact, the closer you are to Allah, the more pure you are to Allah, the entire Quran becomes muhkam. SubhanAllah. That's the power of the Quran. It varies. And we'll talk about it tomorrow. But Allah has given us two kinds of verses. Muhkamat wa mutashabihat. Two kinds of verses. Tonight, I'd like to touch on the essence of the Quran. There were five major stages of the Quran. I think it's important for us in this month of Ramadan to understand it. First and foremost, it's a prescription that was sent to us by Allah as a means to purify us. As a furqan. As a guide, إِنَّ هَذَا الْقُرْآنَ يَهْدِي لِلَّتِي هِيَ أَقْوَامِ 
This Quran guides you to that which is most upright. Give good news to the believers who act good, who do good from the Quran. Meaning they just, they just don't read the Quran. They don't just use the Quran. But rather they live it, they walk it, they talk it. That for them is a great reward because they acted on the Quran. It's very important for us to understand this, brothers and sisters, because if I ever want to embark on my purification, I need a GPS, I need a pathway, I need to hang, hang on to the roots, I need to ground myself. It's like I'm going out in space. I don't want to get lost in space, so I lock myself with earth. Somehow I ground myself with earth, then I leave to space. Should I get lost out there, I have a way to get, to get back. So please, ground yourselves to come back. The Qur'an grounds me. It takes me in the right direction. It shows me what to do, what not to do. It's very, very important. Now, when we talk about, I'll talk about Adam. I know you're all wondering, like, is he going to finish about Adam? I will talk about Adam briefly before this end, uh, inshallah, if Allah wills. But I want you to focus on the purity of the Qur'an. And when we read the Qur'an, it clarifies. Now, the Qur'an gives us allegorical verses that appear like a prophet made a mistake. But they didn't. Because if you read the text correctly, Allah is testing you and I on our usul. Just like when Allah says his hand. Right? Allah says, كُلُّ مَنْ عَلَيْهَا فَانْ وَيَبْقَى وَجْهُ رَبِّكَ ذِي الْجَلَالِ وَالْإِكْرَامِ Everything shall perish except the face of Allah. Ah, Allah has a face. تَبَارَكَ الَّذِي بِيَدِهِ الْمُلْكِ Blessed is he. In whose hands is the universe. Allah says, you did not strike them. I struck them. And Allah uses the metaphors of hands. My hand, فَوْكَ أَيْدِينَ My hand was above your hand. Allah has hands. He says, well, it's here. It's literal. Quran actually says that. And there are literalists in Islam who have gone astray by taking the mutashabihat. Allah says, فَأَمَّا Those who have what we call a sickness in their hearts will take the ambiguous verses, the verses that have more than one interpretation, and they will interpret it in their own whimsical ways to take people away from the truth. Allah says, nobody understands ta'weel except rasikhuna fil ilm, yaquluna amanna. Those deeply rooted in knowledge have totality of belief and they see the Quran, by the way, as a mahkam, complete decisive. There is no ambiguity. Every verse, they know the exact reason of what it implies and they don't have more than one explanation of it unless the secondary explanation is deeper explanation of the first argument, meaning it does not contradict itself. It goes deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. The Rasulun of Al-Ain will take one verse. They'll tell you, for example, لا يمسوا إلا المتحرون. In Surah Al-Waqi, Allah says, لا يمسوا. إنه القرآن الكريم في كتاب ما right. لا يمسوا إلا المتحرون. تنزيل من رب العالمين. إنه القرآن الكريم في كتاب Right. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala now, he's saying to me, this kitab, none can touch it except the purified one. Physically, Allah says, make sure you do wudu when you touch it. But the deeper meaning, mutahharun, are the ones who have purified their hearts. The ones who are chosen by Allah. So who has the most access to it? The prophets and the imams. They have the most access to the Quran. Meaning when they look at the Quran, the entire Quran is mahkam. There is no ambiguity. They will tell you with 100% clarity what every verse means, why the harakat, meaning the fatha, the kisra, the dhamma, the shadda, the tanween. In other words, the way the Quran is describing itself from marfu standard, meaning the i'rab of the Quran, they will tell you exactly why it's singular, why it's plural, why it's masculine, why it's feminine. They will tell you with clarity because they are mutahroom. So Allah is telling me that there are many meanings to this one verse, but each one actually opens up another door of another door of another door, which doesn't close that first door. But anyone who interprets the Quran falsely will close the door of the first one. Meaning the meaning is really that open door, 
But because they're doing it falsely, they end up closing more doors than opening up, and they cause more confusion. So understand that when the Quran is talking to us, even about frowning, turning away, when Allah says, you know, Adam, لا تقرب هذه الشجرة فتكون من الظالمين Oh, Adam, do not approach this tree, lest you become zalimin. Zalimin has meaning. It has multiple meaning. One of its other alternative meaning is litashka, so that you don't sweat, you don't get toiled, you don't suffer. Now let's go back, and you notice, I'm just giving an example here, very simple. You will notice that there are verses in the Quran that are very simple. For example, قُلْ هُوَ اللَّهُ أَحَدْ Say God is one. Unique, simple, very simple. It's mahkab, straightforward, right? Very simple, we understand it. SubhanAllah. So there are verses in the Quran when Allah, for example, says, لا تقربوا الزنا Do not approach adultery. I mean, you don't need a rocket scientist to tell you what that means. You already know. لا تقربوا الصلاة وأنتم سكارة Don't approach prayers when you're sick of drunkenness. Now, this also has multiple meanings. And by the way, one quick footnote. People say, you know, this when this ayah came, Allah forbid alcohol. Where did you people get this from? Alcohol was forbidden from Adam. It didn't come 1400 years ago. Allah did not make alcohol haram 1400 years ago. It was always forbidden. When does Adam or his generation allow the consumption of something that inebriates your brain and destroys you? And why would Allah change that 1400 years ago? So don't say this ayah, this is لا تقرب الصلاة وانتم سكارة. I mean, do not approach prayers when you're in a state of intoxication. It meant that the rule of uh, alcohol came. No, the people who had become Muslims were getting drunk. Because they were used to getting drunk. Because they were Meccans, they were pagans, they used to drink. But they would come in a state of inebriation. They came drunken. And Allah says, don't approach prayer when you're in a state of drunkenness. Don't approach it. It's haram. It doesn't mean that alcohol became haram then. It means Allah is emphasizing that alcohol has always been haram. And don't you dare approach prayer when you're in a state of drunkenness. Now, this also could mean not necessarily alcohol, but worldly. Where you are so entranced about the beauty of somebody or the beauty of your money and you're chasing wealth and now you're coming to Salah Allah when you're thinking about where you're going to put all your millions away or your thousands or whatever. Allah says, don't come to pray when you say you're in a state of ghaflat, when you're in a state of inebriation. Be focused towards me. Don't be drunk with the world, with the alcohol, with the drugs or whatever. Come clear-minded is the verse. Not, not how, how beautiful the Quran is discussing. So let's discuss briefly. When Allah says, وَإِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ إِنِّي جَاعِلٌ فِي الْأَرْضِ خَلِيفَةً When Allah declared to his angels, Indeed, I am going to place on earth my representative. This was before Adam was created. Adam shaped his clay mold and his wife, Hawa, were created and they were curing for a period of time. And historians say that Iblis would pass by it and said, what an ugly being. He was jealous because humans are very beautiful. He was jealous when he saw that magnificent creation. Allah says, I saw what was in the heart of Iblis. Because Allah says, Rabbukum a'lamu bima fi nufusikum. Allah knows what lies in your soul. And Iblis is looking at this form and says, I don't like this form. Jealous. Am yahsudun al-nas. Are you jealous among the mankind that what we have conferred upon this creation? So Iblis was noticing, but Adam didn't have life. And Allah commanded the bowing of the angels in the world of Malakut. Meaning Iblis is not an angel. He was a jinn who was raised among the angels. Therefore, he was in the frame of Malakut. So he was included in that command of bowing, though he was not an angel. Christians and Jews say he's a fallen angel. According to the Quran, angels don't fall, and angels don't sin, and they don't make mistakes. It's in the Quran. So, Allah says, فَسَجَدُوا كُلُّهُمَا إِلَّا إِبْلِيسِ They all bowed. Now, when, when Allah put the soul into Adam, they all bowed. Immediately. So that means this decree of sending the Khalifa on earth was before Adam was even created. Now we argue, and I'm being very simplistic here, we can go into more details in the Q&A sessions and dialogues. 
But you will notice that this decree is Allah's decree. Please reconcile this. This is Allah's decree. It's a decree that came true. Do we agree? Inni ja'inun fil ardi khalifa. Here we are. We're all here. We are khulafa. We're all, by the way, khulafa of Allah. You know that? We're all secondary, tertiary, quaternary khulafas of Allah. We also represent Allah on this earth. He says this. Wajta ba'akum. Right? We are all khulafa in a certain way. We have an obligation of Amr bin Ma'ruf wa Nahir al Munkar. We have to promote good. We have to forbid evil. We cannot exonerate ourselves on the day of judgment to say, Allah, I was not responsible. It was the job of the prophets and the Imams and the Quran to guide. I was just an observer. Allah says, No, 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 no. You were in the arena, you were playing the game with everybody. And all the points count for you or against you. So you and I are khulafa. We are here. So what argument are we going to have? Now, let's look at the decree of Allah. He decreed that Adam should go to earth. Did Adam end up in earth? Yes. That's why we're here. In between what happened, we're going to talk. But the decree of Allah, the primary de decree, cannot be cancelled. Do you agree? Now, let's look at how Adam was told. Allah told Adam, لا تقرب هذه الشجرة don't approach this tree, lest you become burdened. Now Allah put a tree there as a marker. Why did he put a tree there? If Allah said to Adam and Hawa, roam in this garden and enjoy, why put something there and make it a sharia? It wasn't a sharia. In paradise, in this garden, Allah Quran describes this elegantly. He says that was a place for Adam to nurture the start of his trial. Please pay attention. Once this sinks in, subhanAllah, it really makes sense. Then you start to realize, subhanAllah, I read this Quran differently. Allah says, no, come to me correctly. I have a system. If you don't know me, you don't know my prophets, you don't know how I will judge on judgment day, you don't know my imams, you don't know the Uli Amri Minkum, you will not be pure. You won't know how to be pure. So Allah tells Adam, don't approach the tree. But Adam approaches the tree. Who tells him? Iblis tells me, Adam, please go forward. Now, Christians and Jews say that Adam was in paradise. Jannah. Jannah in Arabic means garden. Jannah is a garden. It's not the same paradise that we will be in the next world. That's different. You know why? This Jannah that Adam was in, Iblis was there. Now note, Iblis had already rejected Allah. He was already a Kafir. He was already a Rajim. He was already condemned. What is he doing in the garden? He's not supposed to be entering there because Allah's command says, the impure shall not enter paradise. The pure shall enter paradise. What is Iblis doing there? It was not the Jannah you and I think it is. It was a garden where there were no laws against Adam in Sharia matters. Everything was allowed. Allah gave an advice to Adam that you will begin the trial when you approach the tree. Iblis knew this. Iblis knew his mukhlasin is purified. I cannot touch him, but his generation, I can. So I want Adam to come to earth quickly so that he should have children so that I can start my mischief. And when Adam does approach the tree, did he make a mistake? No, because it was by decree that Allah says he has to come to earth. We all know that the only way he came to earth by, was by the approach to the tree. That means it must have been a divine decree and whatever Allah told him not to approach was only an advisory, not a sharia. Sharia requires punitive damages. It means it requires punishment. But Adam did not get punished. Adam approached the tree. Allah says, Fataba alayhim. Allah turned to him mercifully. But Allah turns to all prophets mercifully. In the Quran, Allah turns to the believers. And Allah yuhibbut tawabin. Allah loves those who are people who do tawbah. Turning towards Allah does not mean you made a mistake. Quick final point I want to make here. That you'll notice that Adam asks Allah for forgiveness. He does. It's in the Quran. As soon as he comes on earth with his wife, he realizes, wow, this is a tough world. I am going to slip, meaning my children, and we also can slip if we're not careful. So he says, Rabbana, ظلمna anfusana, wa illam taghfir lana, wa tarhamna, lanakunanna min al-khasirin. 
This is the verse correctly. He says, oh Allah, we, he's talking about he and his wife, zalamna anfusana, we have burdened ourselves. Wa illam taghfir lana, if you don't protect us from wrong and have mercy on us, we will become losers. Khasirin is a loser. I will lose. I will become bad. He didn't say, Rabbana khasarna anfusana. He said, Rabbana zalamna anfusana. If you understand the Arabic, it's very clear that Adam is praying to Allah the way a prophet should pray. Did Imam Ali salam not tell us in Dua Kumail, zalamtu nafsi wa tajarra'atu bi jahli? Did he not say that I've done zalam, zalamtu nafsi? Zalam, Imam Ali alayhi salam says, I've done zalam on myself. He's ma'asum, he's infallible. Who is he talking to? Allah. In what sense? He is putting himself down in front of Allah because Allah is greater than all imagination. And the only way a believer talks to Allah is through submission and through istighfar. Now, istighfar is a good thing even when you're successful. Allah says, إِذَا جَاءَ نَصْرُ اللَّهِ وَالْفَتْحِ when the help of Allah comes, O Prophet, and you are victorious, and people will enter the religion of Islam in armies. What does Allah therefore say? There's a father. Listen to the verse. The entire verse is victory. The Prophet is successful. When my help comes, people will enter in the millions in Islam. Therefore, hmm? mention my name, worship me, and do istighfar. Istighfar for what? I'm already successful. Everybody is becoming a Muslim. Allah says, that's my ibadah. It is Iblis who doesn't do istighfar. It is Iblis who says, I am perfect and I will not ask for forgiveness. It is Iblis who refuses to do istighfar. So when we see in the Quran prophets doing istighfar, it doesn't mean they make mistakes. It means that they are really prophets. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. So just an example of Adam alayhi Now, Allah says, Fatah alayhi and Adam says, now, question. Notice, Allah said, my only original command was Adam to come on earth. Don't cancel me. Don't belie me. That's the law of Allah. Secondly, when Allah turns to Adam, does Adam salam, ever ask to go back to paradise? You know, if you know, if you and your wife were having a good time there, everything was lovely and no burden, don't you think the first thing Adam should have asked? Okay, since you forgave me, Allah, let me go back. He never asks to go back, ever. Why not? Because he was not decreed to be there. He was decreed to be on earth. So now I ask the initial question. Did Adam make a mistake? Think about it. If he did, he would ask to go back because from a legislative point of view, if you make a mistake and you're kicked out of the room because of bad behavior, and then you're outside and now you ask for forgiveness, logically you must come back. Why is Adam not coming back? Because he knows he was not decreed to come back. So please, let's not go with that idea. Number two is a prophet of Allah. Allah made all the angels, including Iblis, bow to him. Are you telling me that the first thing Adam did when he was given life was disobey Allah? And now he's going to be the model of a prophet who's going to guide all of us to obey Allah. I mean, you flip the head up, upside down. You put the horse in front of the cart. I mean, the cart in front of the horse because it doesn't make sense. So Allah is saying, what do you think? So for you and I, you say, well, Adam made a mistake. Go ahead and say it. Sadly, the entire Christian faith is built on this idea. The only reason Jesus came to die on the cross and risen. In fact, Paul in Corinthians says, were Christ not crucified and risen three days later, Christianity is in vain. It is a hopeless religion. It has no meaning. Unless Jesus dies on the cross and rises again three days later. Can you imagine the axis of the entire Christian faith is predicated on the vicarious atonement of Jesus Christ against the original sin of Adam? When Adam never committed a sin. Think about the concoction that the human race, two billion plus, are going in a whole different wrong direction from one misunderstanding of how a prophet behaved and how he was brought to this earth. Salawat ala Muhammad wa al Muhammad. I'm running out of time. But all, even Yunus alayhi salam, 
Musa alayhi salam. I mentioned some examples. I don't have time tonight. Quick introduction. Quran has five stages. Five main stages. The Quran has five main stages. Introduction tonight. We'll continue this conversation tomorrow. The first stage, Allah says, إِنَّهُ لَقُرْآنٌ كَرِيمٌ فِي كِتَابٍ مكنون. It's an incredibly elegant system. So Allah universe has laws. Every particle in the universe has laws. All creation, by the way, we are one creation. Among creations, we can't even count. And if we can count, it's limited to what we can count. So Allah's creations are greater than all that we can count. We are one creation among his incredibly large number of creations. Among all those creations, Allah has laws for them. Even when you study physics, you will see that a proton, a neutron, an electron, even a quark, which is inside uh, an atomic particle, you will notice it has laws. It follows rules. There are visible laws and there are invisible laws, forces that hold you. How is the earth moving around the sun and not leaving the space? Why is it getting lost in space? Why does it continue to rotate? Hmm? Right? right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions, Everything follows a set course. How does it do that? Allah says, I have laws. I hold everything in place. So the laws of humanity is physical, but the laws of Allah, the main ones, are the moral, ethical laws. The halal, the haram, the do's and the don'ts. The wajibats and the harams and the mustahabbat, etc., that I touched on a few nights ago. All the laws of Allah are transcribed in the universe. Allah is so merciful that He has a central depot of laws for laws. So if you and I were created on another planet and we had, let's say, two heads and seven legs, and our salah was of a different type, where we had to do wudu, let's say, every other leg. Then the law in the Quran, in our Quran, there would be to do that. And let's say instead of 24 hours a day, it was 240 hours a day. Then Allah would give me certain conditions on that. It would vary depending on the physical condition. Earthly conditions, 24 hours a day, 12 months a year, etc. etc. Sunlight, you know, we have day, we have night, night to rest, day to earn. So the laws are that. So Allah says the Quran is from the guarded tablet. It comes from the guarded tablet. It gets extracted to us in spiritual form. Very quick point here. The Quran does not have words. It doesn't have chapters. It doesn't have letters. You know the Quran we're holding has 114 chapters. Has over 6,000 verses. Right? These are transformed from the spirit in written form to allow us to access it. Allah has given us an access means to understand the Quran. The actual Quran is a spirit. It's one shot. When you have purity, the entire Quran becomes part of you. Every aspect of its law controls you. And you don't need to look at it because it is you. It is your composition. Just like you and I are made up of millions of cells but we don't know what they are, but they all make us up. They make me. They allow me to do this. But I don't know what it is. It's a combination. Very quick example of this. So you find the Quran is a spirit. And the Quran entirely was revealed into the heart of the Prophet on the night of Qadr. That's why Allah says, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, Inna anzalnahu fi laylatil Qadr. Anzalnahu in Arabic is different from Tanzilu min Rabbil Alameen. Tanzeel is revealed in stages and parts. Anzalna is the whole Quran. Now we know it took 23 years for the Prophet to receive the Quran. At the age of 40, he was given the first part. Up to the age of 63, he was revealing until he appointed Imam Ali as the finality of his, of his prophethood in the continuity with Wilaya and Imamah. When Allah says, Al-Yawma akmaltu lakum The law was completed. So it took 23 years in practical expressions. And Allah is so merciful. And Allah mentions that in the Quran. He said, I made the Quran applicable based on transactions. When things happen, certain verses were revealed. 
side aside, for example, they ask you about this. They ask you about Ruh. The many people ask, that piece of the Quran was revealed, and a piece of that chapter was revealed, or the entire chapter was revealed to the people. So the second stage which was revealed, the first one was the entire Quran was revealed into the heart of the Prophet. The second, the structure of the Quran was revealed into the heart of the Prophet. So the Prophet knew exactly how the Quran is established. Because Allah says, لا تحرك به لسانك Do not tell the people the recitation and do not make haste in it until I give you the permission. Meaning the Prophet already knew the Quran. So the first stage is spiritual in the guided tablet. Second stage, in the heart of the Prophet. Third stage, constructed form in the Prophet. The Prophet knew exactly all the 114 chapters. Fourth stage, to the people, when he revealed it, when he recited it. Iqra, bismi rabbika alladhi khalaq. When the Prophet started reciting the Quran, that was the fourth stage. People started hearing it. Fifth stage, final stage, the prescribed stage, the one that was written down, encoded, put together. And when the Prophet said, Inni tarikun fikum muthaqalain, kitabullah wa itrati ahl bayti, I leave you two heavy things, the kitab of Allah and your adherence to my new ones, ahl bayt. He left us the book, brothers and sisters. It wasn't scattered pages that were put together by the third caliph. Even that is an untrue statement historically, with all due respect. I don't have time to finish this conversation tonight, but the most beautiful aspect of the Quran, which was the fourth stage, that when it was being revealed to humans, Allah commissioned it to be memorized. Sanukriuka fala tansa. Recite so you don't forget. Illa masha Allah. Accept it which Allah. SubhanAllah, sometimes, you know, I may have memorized the verse, I'm in the middle of a lecture, and I forget it. What is that verse? It's not coming. Also, Allah says, Illa masha Allah. Maybe I'm not going to give it to you today. But the Quran has never failed me. Always comes right at me. Because it's, I'm your helper. I'm your shifa. I'm up here talking, right? Quoting Quranic verses. It's my shifa. So the, the, and the, the final stage was the written stage. But the beautiful stage that we must focus on, besides all of this, two, most important point, is people, thousands of people memorized the Quran while the messenger was alive. Now here's what happened. You can take pages and burn them. You see our Christian scriptures? Creed of Nicaea. The Nicaean Council under Constantine the Emperor passed a creed in 325 AD that all Bibles not approved by the Trinitarian Church should be burned. That was the demise of our Christian scriptures. Although we don't have, we don't have Christianity and Islam, but those Christians who were following those scriptures, they were all demolished. And the true Injil was also demolished. It was burned. Now, you can burn it when it's only written, but how do you burn it when it's memorized? The minute you burn it, they'll write it again. And subhanAllah, look at the power of memorization. I have asked little children, I said, if I recite this surah, which you are reciting every day, Surah Al-Fatiha, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Am I right? I said, yes. I said, what if I said, Alhamdulillahi Rabbul Alameen? Uh-uh, sorry, brother. I said, mashallah, you become a scholar. He said, not a scholar. I just know. It's Rabbil Alameen. I'm sorry. You cannot say Rabbul Alameen. A child is telling me, Allah says, look how I have protected it. Lahafidun. Allah says, inna anzalnahu. Right? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nahnu nazzalnahu dhikr. It is we who revealed the dhikr. And it is we who would protect it. The Prophet ensured that enough people had it in their head. That the pronunciation of the Quran, all 114 chapters, was so meticulously recorded without any ambiguity. Final point with this dua. SubhanAllah, I was in the Islamic Republic of Iran and I met a six-year-old boy whose name was Muhammad Hussein Tabatabai. As you know, he was one of those few uh, world-renowned profiles of the Quran. We have so many, by the way. This was a six-year-old. And his younger brother, who was four years old, was even a hafiz of Quran. And here I'm sitting with this young boy. I'm saying, he knows the entire Quran? It's the entire Quran. He will tell you exactly what word is where. He'll tell you exactly. If you go backwards, he'll tell you where to go. How a six-year-old boy can mem memorize? By the way, it's the only book in the world revealed unto mankind where you can memorize it. Nobody memorizes the Bible. Nobody memorizes the Bhagavad Gita. Nobody memorizes the Torah. Have you ever seen Huffaz of Torah or Huffaz of the Bible? You can't because it's changing every day. But the Quran, 
doesn't change. So subhanAllah, when this boy was reciting, I asked him a question. I said, where did you learn this? He said, Ar-Rahman khalaqa insan allamahu al-bayan. He looked at me, not only did he recite the verse, but he was contextual. He was talking to me with the Quran. A six-year-old boy. And he was so good. He knew exactly to the ayat. I said, a six-year-old can memorize? Allah says, even a, a newborn can memorize. Because that's my power of protection of this blessed Quran. May Allah give us a tawfiq, inshallah, to, to discuss this further. And inshallah, we will continue. Especially, the second part I want to make is, which I'll recite tomorrow, is the Prophet was the Quran. He did not deliver the Quran only. He was the Quran. He was a mailman who took the Quran from point A to point B. He was the Quran. Salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Rabbana aghfir lana. Wa li khwanina al-lazina sabakuna bil-iman. Wa la taj'al fi qulubina ghilla lil-lazina amanu. Rabbana innaka ra'ufur rahim. Let's recite Amma Yujib al-Muttar Raiza al-Aal five times. People have asked me this. It's much needed in this blessed month of Ramadan. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء All together please أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء One more time أما يجيب المضطر إذا دعا ويكشف السوء برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين صلوات على محمد وآل محمد